Good afternoon. Welcome to Prosper Lecture organized by the Office of Communication IISC. Today we are privileged to have Professor uh, Jayant Murthy who will speak on Nightfall and Ashen of Tribute or how I made it into Wikipedia. Uh, we look forward to the interesting talk. Before I, we begin, I would like to give a brief, brief introduction of Professor Murthy. Professor Jayant Murthy got his PhD from John Hopkins University in 1987 and then went to do uh, uh, went to NASA uh, Goddard Space Flight Center for a postdoc for two years. He was a research scientist at the John Hopkins University for 10 years before joining Indian Institute of Astrophysics in 1999. He retired as a senior professor in 2021. He has published over 100 papers in the scientific literature and has uh, supervised over 20 PhD students and an unaccounted number of project students. Professor Muti's research interests are in the field of space uh, missions, interstellar dust, and diffusing, diffuse radiation field. We welcome you, Professor, here to the IAS and uh, request you to give you a lecture. Thank you. All right, so one small correction. It's actually the Johns Hopkins University. So we, we, we tend to be very sensitive as that, uh, uh, about that. As uh, M Mark Twain once came to Hopkins and he, he, uh, he said that uh, he, the advice he gave was that uh, anyone who couldn't spell the name John no one would trust people from the university. But uh, we've stuck to our, our name, and uh, we're, we're proud of it. So this talk is, uh, grew out of a uh, project that a student did with me one summer. And uh, typically what happens is that uh, if students come to me, depending on the student, sometimes they come and they say, we want to do a project. But you know, to do a project in, in astronomy is actually quite difficult these days because there's a lot of uh, overhead that comes into it. And so I pick problems that, that, uh, that, that just seemed interesting to me at the time. And Nightfall is one of those. Another student of mine uh, <clears throat> more recently, he's, uh, uh, if, if you know anything about the planet Neptune, it was the first planet found with the point of a pen. So what they did was uh, Le Verrier and Adams, because of Uranus's uh, uh, wobble in its orbit, they predicted where the planet would be. And uh, you know, I, I thought, okay, this might be a, a fun problem for, for a student to do. And so we, we worked on it. it uh, so it turned out that it's actually uh, a much tougher problem. Those guys in the 18th century were actually excellent mathematicians, far better mathematicians than, uh, than, than us poor astronomers. But the student did a great job and uh, they discovered some new way of doing it. So, so the guy is now in uh, Switzerland doing a, doing a PhD in astronomy. And uh, we, we put, so I picked little projects like that that, uh, that the students can do. So this was one of those projects. So it, it's not what I really do. Uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Das said, I, I really work on uh, interstellar medium and, uh, and things like that. But uh, uh, you know, sometimes you go somewhere and, and someone asks, what do you do? And then uh, I, I say, oh, well, I'm, a, I'm an astrophysicist. And then they say, yeah, well, you must be really, really smart. And then I say, well, yes, I am. And uh, that's the end of the conversation. So I thought maybe better not to speak about the stuff I really do. Maybe there's five people in the world who are interested in what I do. And, uh, and talk, about, uh, talk about something that, that may be of more general interest. So of course, there's lots of these little things going around. Uh, you know, there was the, uh, the girl who, uh, who, who went out on a date and she told her, uh, her uh, proposed boyfriend all about coelacanths, the, the fish. And she, she said uh, the guy never called her again. And she, she wondered if maybe she should have taken more pictures. So I mean, that's, uh, that's scientists. We work on, on, on things that no one cares about. And uh, I mean, actually, it, it could be serious, you know. It's, uh, uh, it, this is not what I'm actually paid for. I mean, you know, if I if you ask uh, ask any of our directors, they would tell you, or or, or DST, they might be quite uh, shocked to to hear what I do. 
And uh, Arnab, who I actually met back in the old Chandrayaan days when, when he was with Times Now, uh, he, he asked me to, to, to I, was in, I was in the studio in, uh, oh, I'll tell you what happened. What happened was that uh, some newspaper asked me for, an, for my opinion on Chandrayaan, the first one. And I said, oh, you know, I think it's a great project, great technical project. But if I had 400 crores, I wouldn't spend it going to the moon. Because, I mean, I, plus, plus they had all this stuff about helium-3 and all that other nonsense. So, uh, so Arnab, who's always looking for a fight, I guess, he, he, he liked that and he asked me to come to Bombay and be in their studio. And so, uh, I mean, the way these guys work, they tell you at 7 o'clock, we're booking you on a, on a 9 o'clock flight, get to the airport. So I went, and uh, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, I think that was the day that India won the World Cup or something like that, and so they uh, crowded me out, gave me 30 seconds of air time, and so, uh, well, that was my experience there. So the answer I have to that is really, what, what, what is academics? I mean, academics is really the, uh, the study of things that, that are interesting. We can't limit it. We, we don't know what will be useful. We don't know what people will like. And so uh, when we do academics, I think it's incumbent on us to really, to really defend the, the uh, idea of curiosity-driven research. We do things that are interesting to us. I, and this, I guarantee you, is true of all scientists, whether you work in, uh, in, in, in finding cure for cancer or for malaria or whatever. You do it mostly because you're interested in the problem. It's the problem solving that's interesting. And so, uh, so I do think that it's important. And uh, fortunately, our directors have always, either they've been understanding or they just think that I'm too annoying to bother with. So, you know, just let, let him do what he wants. Let's not, let's not bother. <laughs> so the, the, uh, so what I'm going to do in this talk is to give a little introduction to the story and to the times and then uh, talk about the work we did. And maybe I'll talk a little less about the work we did because again, it's, uh, it's something that, uh, that what, what I wanted the student to do in this work was really get an idea of the scientific process. So uh, you, you go, you look for the data, and then you try to place the data in context and you try to come to a conclusion. And finally, at the end, we wrote a paper and put it on uh, archive which is our uh, public relation, I mean our public uh, repository. So Nightfall, the story itself, was uh, a short story written uh, in 1941, and uh, it was expanded into a full-length novel in 1990. So the short story was, was by Asimov, and the uh, full-length novel uh, was done in, in uh, collaboration with Robert Silverberg. So the, uh, the short story, is generally considered to be the greatest short story in, uh, in science fiction. Uh, made many, many polls, many uh, surveys, and it has normally been considered to be the, uh, the greatest short story. The, uh, uh, you can, by the way, you can get it on the, on the web. The, the uh, PDF is available. I have one of the old Asimov, the old Penguin editions. The uh, a short story is much better than the book like many of the short stories that, that are in uh, science fiction, Ender's Game, uh, Flowers for Algernon, the short story is much better than the book because it's a short, focused uh, narrative. So that, that's the genesis of, uh, of uh, Nightfall. Now when we talk about science fiction, you, if you go to Wikipedia, which is always the first port of call, the, probably the greatest of the uh, uh, greatest benefit of the internet age. They say that science fiction is a genre of fiction dealing with imaginative content such as futuristic settings, futuristic science and technology, space travel, time travel, faster than light travel, parallel universes, and extraterrestrial life. And so this was the science fiction when I was young. It was mostly space travel, mostly hard science, meaning physics. It was mostly physics. I. Uh, and, and many, if you, if you talk to many scientists, they would tell you that they came into science because of science fiction. They wrote, or, or, or maybe because of the, uh, of the space program, because of Apollo. 
but certainly many scientists were science fiction fans when they were when they were young interestingly when I gave this talk uh, uh, maybe a few months ago or maybe a year ago uh, a young student came to me and she said that um, in the same way that that perhaps I went into physics because of science fiction she went into biology because of science fiction and uh, this is a change in in science fiction and, and perhaps it's partly because I'm not so familiar with much of the modern stuff but uh, much of the modern stuff has gone much more into sociology or uh, uh, things like uh, uh, Neuromancer, uh, William Gibson's work where, where you do the uh, brain, brain interface stuff and, and so she said that she was inspired to go into biology because she was a science fiction fan whereas when I was young what we were do, what we wanted to do, uh, there was not a single one of us who didn't think that we'd have a base on uh, Ganymede by now. That we'd be exploring the, uh, the the whole solar system. And so this is the the final sentence here. Authors commonly use science science fiction as a framework to explore politics, identity, desire, morality, social structure, and other literary themes. And it's a it's a good way to build your own world and uh, uh, you, you don't really have to tie it to, uh, to anything, to anything in, 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 in life. Now, when did science fiction start? If you say the greatest science fiction story, so when did science fiction start? So I normally would say that it started with Mary Shelley. Frankenstein was really the first science fiction story. But uh, people, different people think different things and uh, certainly Kepler's uh, Somnium, which I have not read, uh, deals with, uh, uh, with, with I think it's uh, living, cre living people on the moon. And so he talks about going there. And uh, I mean, you need science for science fiction. So if you, if you don't have science fiction, if you don't have science, then it's just magic. Now, in the, uh, by the late 19th century, this was a pretty mature subject. And so this is when you started getting the hard science fiction of H.G. Wells. Uh, the, the time machine, uh, the um, uh, the uh, uh, what's what's that Martian invasion called? Uh, anyway, wh whatever, war, war of the worlds, war of the worlds. So, uh, uh, which which my son hated because uh, it ends in a in a Deus Machina where uh, where where the uh, Martians get infected by Earth uh, bacteria or birth uh, viruses and die, and so he uh, he was quite upset by that. He thought it was. Uh, he thought it was uh, just uh, uh, an escape clause, which of course it was. And uh, Jules Verne, who uh, wrote From the Earth to the Moon, where uh, he, uh, he shot the astronauts into the moon. I've forgotten how they got back, but they went from the Earth to the Moon in a three kilometer long cannon. And uh, they went to the moon, they met all these moon people, and, and like I said, I've forgotten how they came back. And then you had the space opera. So I'll, I'll let this play. You may recognize, you should at least recognize the music.
well, of course, it's Freddie Mercury and uh, and Queen. And uh, uh, Flash Gordon was, uh, I, I think the movie was in the late 80s. And so it was a classical, it was a classic uh, example of, of space opera. So space opera started in the turn of the century, the turn of the 20th century, with uh, one of the first authors being Doc Smith. Not actually a doctor, but, but people called him Doc Smith. And uh, what he wrote was, uh, uh, you know, it was always handsome young men and, hands and beautiful young women, and, and of course a very sexist world, so you had a brawny guy always going off to save the universe and the, the, the girl behind him to, to uh, uh, you know, every, every man has a woman behind him sort of stuff. <coughs> And so uh, the, 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 he, if you if you read his stuff now, you would think it's nothing but cliches. But of course, he originated many of the cliches. <clears throat> then you have uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, uh, Tarzan, but also John John Carter of Mars. I, I like the movie. No one else seems to have, but I, I like the movie. And so this was the classic age of space opera. And you had covers like this, uh, as I said, the uh, the handsome, brawny young guy always, uh, I, I guess, oh, this guy's black-haired, so I guess the men could be raven-haired. And the women were invariably blonde and uh, torn clothing and so on. And so this was the era of pulp SF. And this would be around this time of the Second World War. And the reason it was called pulp SF was because uh, paper was uh, was was limited. So what they would do is they would recycle the paper, and uh, and they would make the uh, the magazines out of that. So so pulp SF because it was pulped paper. And uh, there were there were a bunch of these uh, uh, these, these classic classic uh, uh, serials or classic periodicals, amazing stories, analog, and a lot of the uh, uh, the the big names of science fiction. So Hugo Gernsback who was the publisher for uh, Amazing Stories. And now the Hugo Award in, uh, for the best science fiction story of the year is, is given for, for him. Another of the big names was uh, John Campbell. And he was the editor of Astounding Science Fiction from uh, 1937 to 1971. And many people would argue that he was responsible for what's called the golden age of science fiction from, uh, uh, let's say, the, the uh, uh, 50s to the 60s. And uh, the, the, the big names were Arthur Clarke, Robert Heinlein, and, and Asimov. Silverberg, if you asked him, he would say that, uh, that he was part of the Golden Age, but, but probably not. And so, uh, as, I, as I said, one of the three big science fiction authors of that golden age was, was Asimov. We'll talk a little bit about Heinlein and Clark later. But Isaac Asimov, he was born in Russia on uh, January 2nd, 1920. But there's a little bit of doubt about that because uh, the Russians, this was just at the time of the revolution, and they had changed calendars recently. So it's possible that he was actually born in October or whatever it was. But this is the date that he said. He said he was born on January 2nd, 1920. And he grew up in Brooklyn. And his uh, family owned a, a series of, of candy stores. They sold candy. Of course, this was a big thing in the 1910, 1920s. And probably the, uh, they, they, lived in, they must have lived in one of these Jewish areas of New York. Where, uh, where, where, they, uh, where, where the Russians were, would settle. And Asimov himself spoke uh, uh, fluent Yiddish and English. And he was, a, he was a wide reader, and he read a lot of science fiction, a lot of, a lot of the classic pulp SF. And his father, uh, like, I guess, uh, typical Jewish father, typical Indian father, typical Indian mother, whatever, he, uh, he suggested that his son might want to focus more on useful things rather than reading science fiction. But Asimov said, look, it's got science in the title. It's, it's science, science fiction, science. So, so his father bought, the, bought that, and, uh, and Asimov did read a lot of science fiction. And he went to the New York public school system, which was uh, very good at the time. And uh, if you go to the right, right schools, the New York public school system is still very good. Then after that, he went to Seth Lowe Junior College, 
which was a, a, a college of Columbia University. And at the time, they still had quotas for, uh, for Jews. And so Jews were not allowed into Columbia University. So, so they went to Setlo Junior College, which was a, uh, an offshoot. And then uh, he went to Columbia for his, he did his MA and his PhD from Columbia. He got his uh, PhD in 1948. And of course, the war was in between. So like many other scientists, he went and worked for the military at the time. So 1942 to 1945, he worked for the uh, Philadelphia Navy Yards. And so the three people there are uh, Heinlein on the left, uh, L. Sprague de Camp in the middle, and Asimov on the right. So Heinlein was, uh, uh, people, people would say that his politics depended on his wife. So his first wife was, uh, was a communist, and so he started out being a very left-wing writer. His uh, second wife was uh, pretty far over to the right. And so this is when his really weird phase started, so Stranger in the Strange Land, uh, which, which I guess, I never liked it, but I guess it became a cult favorite. And uh, uh, Grok, for instance, comes from Stranger in a Strange Land. And, and so his, uh, I, I like his earlier books, the Moon is a Harsh Mistress, all the, uh, the, the Green Hills of Earth, all the classic science fiction. I, I don't like his uh, more modern stuff where, uh, or even, uh, um, uh, uh, what's that one called where, where the, the, the battle, the uh, Starship Troopers. Starship Troopers, which is a, which is a really fascist book where uh, you can't vote unless you fight. So uh, if, you, if you're not in the military, then you don't have a vote. The, the movie, interestingly enough, uh, is, uh, uh, it, it was made by a Dutch, Dutch uh, filmmaker. I've forgotten what his name was. Hmm? OK. And uh, he, I, I watched the movie, and it was actually, I don't think he quite made the point he wanted to make, because he was not a fascist. And so it was more of an uh, anti-fascist movie. I, I actually quite liked it. And uh, even the actors weren't quite sure what they were making. But the book itself, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty fascist book. OK, so that was Heinlein. And uh, L. Sprague de Camp, he went out of the military. And he had, uh, uh, I guess like me, a profound uh, uh, disrespect for bureaucracy after that. Uh, he, he got in with the bureaucracy. Uh, Eric Frank Russell is another. You, you, uh, Alamagusa, where, where uh, uh, they, they, uh, the, the, the official dog is, is missing from the spaceship. But because it's called an offog in the, in the manifest, they spend all their tr time trying to put together an offog, not realizing that it's an official dog. And so uh, these, these people came out with a profound disrespect for, for bureaucracy. And then Asimov himself, himself he, he came out as a confirmed pacifist. So he, uh, he was a member of, uh, of many of the, uh, uh, well, I mean, he was, a, he was a committed pacifist. And he wrote hundreds of books. There's actually no real count of how many books he wrote, because uh, what happened is that uh, the books were published under different names. And so it, it gets hard to, to keep track. He uh, was a full professor at Boston University, but he became non-teaching after 1958, because that's when he started earning more from science fiction than from his uh, faculty position. And so he came to an agreement with Boston University. He said. Uh, uh, they, they, they agreed to let him keep his full professorship, but they wouldn't pay him any salary. Does anyone want to take a guess at what that salary was? $7,000 a year in uh, 1958. And then after the 1950s, he wrote largely nonfiction. And this was purely a commercial decision. Uh, he, the, the nonfiction paid more per word than the fiction did. So he said, OK, I'm just going to write more nonfiction. And he died, he died in 1992. He actually was, uh, died of AIDS, which he got from a blood transfusion. And they uh, hid it for a, for a while, because uh, in the 1990s, 
the, the social uh, mores. So what he said after he died, or what he said not after he died, but uh, what he what he said was that uh, what he wanted to be remembered for are the foundation. What he what he will be remembered for is the foundation trilogy, and and the three laws of robotics, and uh, uh, the foundation trilogy again. He got a special award for uh, the best trilogy in science fiction. The, there was a really horrible adaptation on Apple TV. And this is something I can't understand of these guys. Same thing with the Rings of Power. You have the greatest writers of all time, and, and you think you can write better than they did? So you really screw up the, the story by, by, by making it completely, you know, completely different. And uh, uh, the, the three laws of rob robotics, uh, uh, what are they? Uh, you, you'll do no uh, robots will... Uh, uh, the first law is that uh, you will do no harm to humanity, I guess. The second law is you will not harm any person. And the third law is that you will protect yourself. It's been a long time since I, since I went through the three laws. <laughs> and uh, I guess this is, again, this is, must be a big thing in the AI community. They, they must really think a lot about this. But uh, so what he said is that uh, he, he wanted to be remembered for, it was not for a specific work but rather for his entire body of work. Anything could be, could be uh, uh, paralleled or, or surpassed, but uh, his total quantity was, was really unsurpassed by almost anyone else. And so even Nightfall, he was actually not very happy about Nightfall being voted the greatest short story of all time, because he wrote it when he was 18. And he said, is it really possible that I've done nothing better since I was 18? Now there was uh, uh, so so here's some of the books that he's written, and you can see that there's a pretty wide range, some of which might not be so politically correct. I have not read all of them, but uh, but I will tell you one of the books that that uh, was um, was. Uh, uh, that, that, that while I was growing up, he had a two-volume book on, uh, on all of science, Encyclopedia of Science. And that was really a, a beautiful read, the, those two volumes. So that, that I still have them at home. So he would always have this competition with Arthur Clarke because uh, he would look at anyone else and he would say, uh, maybe if they'd written as much fiction as, as, he, as the, he had, he would say, but look, you haven't written any nonfiction, so I'm a much better nonfiction writer than you are. And if they, if they were good science communicators, then he would say, uh, well, look, have you written any science fiction? But he and uh, Arthur Clarke always had this competition because Clarke was, uh, had the same body of, of science fiction. And incidentally, this is another project that I've had students do, but we've never got to a, to a real stage, which is uh, the uh, Rama, which is the, uh, uh, the interstellar spaceship that they send through. So I just wanted to figure out how one would build it. And, and uh, we never really got to any stage, any useful stage, but I thought it was interesting. So uh, Asimov has, uh, I mean, Arthur Clarke so wrote, he, he has that huge body of fiction, and he also has a huge body of nonfiction. So he, uh, uh, the, the whole concept of a space elevator came from him. Geosynchronous orbits originated with Arthur Clarke. And he himself was an interesting character in his own right. He was, uh, he was gay. And of course, this was not a good thing to be in uh, post-war England, as we know from uh, Turing. So he, uh, he went to Sri Lanka and uh, he had a big uh, estate in Sri Lanka, and that's where he lived for, for his life. So the, the, uh, the story is that they were riding together in a taxi in New York one day, and, and they were arguing about who was the better writer. So they came to an agreement, and uh, uh, what this agreement was was uh, later called the Asimov-Clark uh, Treaty. And so what they said was that uh, uh, Asimov was required to insist that Arthur Clarke was the best science fiction writer in the world. Uh, of course, Asimov would be second. And Asimov would be the best science writer in the world, while Clarke would be second best. And so, uh, as far as I know, they kept to this agreement for the rest of their lives. Now, Nightfall itself 
was uh, inspired by a quotation from Emerson. That's Emerson there. If the star should appear one night in a thousand years, how would men believe in the door and preserve for many generations the remembrance of the city of God? And so apparently Campbell said to Asimov that he thought that, that uh, uh, rather than worshipping God, that the sight of the stars would drive, would, would drive uh, people mad. And so Asimov uh, went off with this, and the short story was, uh, uh, was first appeared in, in uh, 1941. So I guess he was uh, 21 then, born in 1920. And then uh, uh, the book was adapted with Robert Silverberg, and so that's the cover of the book in, in 1991. The short story is, as I said, available. Uh, anyone can, can download it. The, the book is not. But uh, most of the work we did depended on the book because uh, he fleshed out the, the descriptions of the, of the physics more in the book. And uh, what, what happens is that at the end of the short story, and I hope I'm not uh, spoiling it for anyone, at the end of the short story, the world ends in fire. And uh, what he does in the book is that he carries on after the, the world ends in fire. There's a religious sect that, uh, that keeps civilization alive. And they do it basically by setting up a theocratic civilization in which they, they maintain control. And so the story is set on this planet uh, Kalgash. And uh, I've, now I've forgotten which it is in the book and which is, it, it is in the short story. In, I think in the short story it's called Lagash, and in the book it's Kalgash. And so here's just a bunch of details around it. It uh, orbits its star at 1.2 AU, and that star is a sun-like star. And then there's five other stars, so a total of six stars. Uh, and uh, they don't see any other stars. Now, because it's such a complicated system, if you look at our own solar system, it's pretty simple. The sun is there, and everything orbits the sun. So it's pretty easy to, de de to derive the law of gravitation. But in this system, everything is much more complicated because you have uh, six stars. And, uh, and the planet going around in some more complicated uh, geometry. And so the law of gravitation was only discovered a few years before, before the story. And uh, the important thing, which no one knows, is that civilization is destroyed every 2,049 years. And so the story starts by, uh, by, an, archaeolo by an archaeologist going to some ruins and, uh, and finding this 2049 year cycle. And later on, they see that, it, uh, that, that it's also in the, in the religious writings of this, uh, of this prophetic uh, sect, of the sect of prophets. So uh, as I said, I, this is something that I've sort of been thinking of for, for many years. And I, I did it off and on for a few years. I tried to write a program to do uh, to, to simulate the, the gravitation, I mean, the orbit of the planets. But it turns out that this is actually quite difficult to do because uh, uh, you, you want to model your, your system over a few billion years. And uh, you need it to do it at, uh, at uh, the way you do it is that uh, your planet goes around the, the star. And uh, you, you, you uh, assume that your circle is made up of a bunch of tangents. So you just uh, have, have the planet go around, and you, you calculate the instantaneous acceleration, and, and you do it as a continuous, uh, continuous thing. But in order to, in order to get the, uh, the, in order to keep it going around, you need to work on a time scale, on a, on a time step of a second or so, and you need to maintain it for a billion years or so. And eventually, you just run out of precision. Even if you use double precision uh, numbers, you just can't do it. So this is not the way they do it, that the professionals do it. The professionals use all sorts of tricks like uh, conservation of energy and, and so on. So it's something that I, that I was thinking of. But then uh, the student came, and so I said, look, why don't we work on this? Let's not do the detailed modeling, but at least let's figure out uh, qualitatively what's going on. And so as I said, the main thing was that, uh, the, the main purpose was just that he would learn how to, how, how to attack a scientific problem. You, you search for the data, you search for your uh, constraints, and then you go through and you, uh, you, you derive a model, and then you, you publish it. 
So he did that. He, he went through, he, he wrote it up, and, uh, and we put it on, on archive under the pop sci category. Turns out that uh, just uh, a couple of months before that, these uh, bunch of uh, students from, uh, from Hopkins, in fact, wrote a similar article on the weather of, uh, of the Game of Thrones. Because uh, I've never actually seen that, but apparently it shifts from ice to fire and, and song of ice and fire, right? So it shifts from ice to fire within a period of, of days or months or whatever it is. And so they figured out, th so they wrote how to do it. I think their final conclusion was that it was all due to dragons. But uh, uh, so, so that was just a few months before. And, and, and this is, they, they, they said, we don't want our advisors to find out we worked on this. And, instead of working on their PhD theses, but whatever. So, so we wrote it up, and, uh, and uh, people picked it up. I, I, I uh, looked for Nightfall on Wikipedia maybe two days later, and already people had referenced it. So, so it's one of my uh, few, few uh, uh, notations in, in Wikipedia. And then after that, a lot of people picked it up. So uh, uh, we, we were on a podcast by Physics Central, which I think is the American Physical Society, uh, where they, they interviewed us. And uh, we, we made it to this uh, Spanish website, which I found just randomly. They, they described it. Uh, they, I, I got, I got a, a few emails. I got an email from a, from a neurosurgeon or something like that in, in Texas. And he said, normally I don't read any science articles, which is a little worrying if, if it's a neurosurgeon. But uh, uh, he, so he said, but, but yours was uh, interesting. So I read it. I got, an, I got an email from a Republican senator, which, which again seems quite kind of odd. He was a state senator, senator in uh, Iowa, I think it was. And he said he was a physics teacher. And so he would use this uh, for, his, uh, for his class. So it was. It was like, so. So we got a a, a, lot, a fair bit of attention from that, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised if more people read that than read any of my uh, my science papers. So, uh, <clears throat> so that was. So all of this was was of course science fiction. Uh, the the six planets. I mean the six sun system and so on. But now, if you look at the stuff from Kepler. There's uh, an enormous variety of planetary systems from Kepler. And so this is a five-star system from uh, taken, uh, this is a Dirk Turrell, who is an astrophysicist in, I think, in the University of Colorado. And they had him on the same podcast. And uh, he, he, he draws, uh, or, or he paints pictures. He paint, paints astronomy pictures. And so this is the view from uh, the moon of one of the gas giants of that system. And, and uh, I mean, here you have, you, you would never think that a six sun system would be stable just because of chaotic effects. You get so many, gra you get all sorts of weird gravitational effects. And you would think that one star would be thrown out of the system or uh, planets would be thrown. I mean, how do you ever get a planet forming in a six star system? But there are. There are planetary systems which are even weirder. And uh, here, here's the Kepler orrery as of a couple of years ago. These are all the weird planets. You have uh, Jupiter-sized planets orbiting inside the, uh, the distance of Mercury. And so I'm going to uh, uh, go a little fast through the through the the work that we did. But what we did was so what we did was we looked through we looked through the book, and we picked out all the observables. So everything that Asimov said about about the physics of the system. Now Asimov himself he didn't really care about physics. He was more of uh, he was, he wrote it more because of the sociological aspects because of. Uh, uh, of the idea that uh, what, what what would happen, what would be, what would be the psychology when they saw this, uh, uh, when they saw the stars. And he's done this in other books too. If you if you look at it, it's hard science fiction, so it's pretty. It's based on on hard science, but then if you want to pick holes in it, it it's not not hard to pick holes in the in the physics. 
So, uh, so th that was, but, but you know, we, we go ahead, you're always allowed one plot hole. So we went through and we went through, and we, I mean, we went through the book. As I said, we went through the book rather than the short story because the book has more detail. So we went through and we found uh, uh, whatever, whatever things he had given. So uh, you, you have Kaldash, which is a, uh, orbits Onos, which is a yellow star. If it's a yellow star, it means it's a sun-like star at 1 AU. You have uh, a Trey and Patra, which are a binary star. They're white in color. If they're white in color, but they're main sequence stars, that would mean, because we know the size, we know that all blue stars are, are big. So then that would make them blue giants. If you have blue giants in the system, then you couldn't have any life on, uh, on, on these planets because uh, you're, you're bathed in radiation. They're, they put out so much heat. So they must be white dwarfs. Uh, Dovim is a red star. He says it's a red star. If it's a red star, then it must be a, a, an M dwarf. And we know how big an M dwarf is. It's uh, whatever times uh, maybe a tenth of a solar radius. So we know we, we, we pick out a lot of information from this. Uh, okay, the, uh, there are no other stars visible except that, that at the end when it's, uh, when it's all dark, we know that, uh, that the planetary system is at the edge of a globular cluster. So we know that there's hundreds of thousands of stars within a few parsecs or a few light years of this. And the light from those stars is hidden by the brightness of the sky. And uh, the, the thing that, that's important for the story, the only thing that Asimov really cared about, he, he didn't really have to make such a complicated system, I guess. But anyway, the only thing that's really important is that there's an eclipse for 9 to 14 hours every 2,049 years by a moon whose diameter is seven times that of Dover, seven times the diameter of that red star. And how do we know this? Because, uh, because they have this astronomy group and uh, the astronomy group, the, that's where the guy who discovered what they call the, whatever the law of gravitation is, that, uh, that, that's his astronomy group. As it turns out that, uh, I mean, people never like know-it-alls. So uh, when, when the uh, troubles come, they're the first place to be burnt. So the, the, the mobs come with, uh, with, with torches and, and burn down the, the observatory <coughs> after they go mad. After, after seeing the stars. Okay, and, uh, and the last thing is that experiments show that people go mad when, uh, well, go insane at times of darkness. And they, the way they, one of the ways they know this is that they have a, 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 an amusement park ride where it's like a tunnel of love. You go into the darkness and uh, a significant number of people go into the tunnel of darkness and come out insane. So of course they try to hush it up and, and so on, but uh, that's what happens. So then because of this, we know uh, something about the star. The star has to be bright enough to plot out the nearest cluster. It's an M-type star. And as I said, again, I don't want to go too much into the details. It's, uh, uh, you know, the details can be boring. But we know because it's an M-type star, we know how bright it is. And uh, uh, what we did was uh, the, the faintest object in the visible sky is a magnitude of about minus four. You can see the moon in, di in the daytime sky. And so uh, you, you can see how much fainter, you can see the, you, how much fainter than the sun it is. So we, uh, we, we went through, we worked out the, the characteristics of the orbit. <clears throat> and so finally, what we, what we said was that, again, this, this is given here, the angular diameter is seven times that of the star. So based on all of that, we calculated some or orbits for the, for the moon and for the planet. So you use Kepler's laws for this. The uh, uh, Kalgash and Kalgash 2, which is the moon, they have roughly equal mass, and so they orbit around their center of mass. And, uh, and so you can calculate how fast they're going at, uh, at any point. You know that it's seven times the orbit of the, uh, seven times the diameter of the star. So that gives you something. You know that an eclipse has to last for a full orbit, for full rotation, because it it affects everyone in the world. So everyone goes insane. And so based on all this, we we calculate some uh, parameters of that. If uh, the moon was, uh, if the density is close to that of our own moon, 
If the we, we know that the mass is about the same, so clearly if it's denser, the mass is uh, the, the the size is less. So we it has to be a large moon because if it if it's the density has to be small, the density has to be close to that of the uh, of the Jovian planets. Otherwise, it wouldn't be large enough to give you an eclipse that lasted long enough. And so we just calculated some various orbits and some various uh, diameters. And so this is what we came up with. <clears throat> and I, I note that this is purely, purely back of the envelope stuff. We didn't do any detailed calculations. After all, the guy was only working with me for two months. So we just came, came up with this kind of orbit. And this uh, was in Wikipedia for a while. I don't know if it still is. It still is. And so we always had this idea that we would do some future work, that maybe we would model it better. Maybe we would uh, try to uh, put in some graphics. But, but uh, Smarin, the, the student, he went off. And, uh, and I never got another student back to do the same thing. So, uh, so, so we never actually did do anything like that. And here's a quote from Asimov that I always have liked, so the, the, and which uh, the students don't normally understand. So that is, if the, if the universe is not quite as you thought it was, you better rearrange your beliefs, because you certainly can't rearrange the universe. And uh, the, the problem with many students is that they have a model of something that works, and uh, they would rather rearrange the, uh, the data so that it fits their models rather than, uh, because after all, the models have been written. Someone wrote the models and they're in a book. And any time you see anything in a book, well, you can't change it. So, uh, so this is a discussion that students and I have had over, over the years. And then it turns out that this guy, Sean Raymond, who's uh, in France somewhere, He's actually done a lot of stuff after, after we did. He was very nice to say, he, he was very nice about the stuff that we wrote. He said, you're absolutely wrong, but he, was, he, was, he said it nicely, uh, which, is, which is always uh, to be appreciated. And so he came up with, uh, he, he's actually done proper simulations. So he's got proper orbit simulators, done proper gravitational simulations. And so what he came up with is, uh, is something that looks like this. And there's an enormous number of variations on this. So uh, you, can, you can go to his website, uh, search for Sean Raymond, you can go to his website. And he's done a lot of stuff on different planets in the uh, science fiction universe. So I, I guess the most relevant now is he's worked on, on Dune. So he, he's done something about Dune. And, and he's got other neat things. So how many planets can you put in an orbit? I think you can put something like a million, like uh, a million planets in an orbit, something like that. If you want to put a stable orbit around the sun, put something like a million Earths in orbit. So, uh, so he's he he improved on our work immensely. Put it on a on a solid uh, a solid computational basis. And so what we did is we left it there. And as far as I know, Smarnan has, uh, he's now gone into, uh, uh, he, he's now gone into industry. He's doing Python programming. One of the great things about astronomy is that you learn data analysis and that uh, people will pay you a lot better for doing data analysis in industry than they will pay you in, in uh, science. So, uh, so, so that's what he's doing. So this is where we left it. And like I said, I, we, I've, uh, anytime a student comes, we, we, put up, I, I have them work on other problems like this. So one of the problems that, that we've had is uh, if you go back to Herschel, Herschel has, uh, has a model for the universe, which is basically spherical. Because uh, when he looked up, when he and his, uh, and his sister, who has been uh, uh, pretty much uh, man washed out of the story, woman washed out of the story, whatever, uh, she, she took a lot of the observations. And uh, <coughs> And uh, uh, you, so, so they looked up and they counted stars in different areas of the sky. And now if you do it with a modern instrument or with a modern catalog, you of course don't get anything that looks like that. You see, you see the galaxy as a plane, you see the Milky Way. And uh, so it's interesting, you can, you, can, uh, 
you can ask the student to, to model what Herschel would see. So, so, we, so we've got a bunch of little projects like that. None of them have really gone far. It all depends on how much the student is able to put, how much time the student is able to put into it. But at least they, they learn uh, data analysis, they learn some uh, scientific methods. So, so that's the kind of stuff that, uh, that I do that, that's not my, my real science. So let me stop there and uh, happy to take any questions that So the planet is uh, is going around this star here. So it's that small orbit. So what you have is you have you, you have this is a binary system. These are two stars that are orbiting each other. These are two stars that are orbiting each other and the planet is in the middle. And then around all of them is this other system that's far away. So like I said, we did it purely qualitatively. And it turns out that it's not actually gravitationally stable. He wrote this when he was. When he was very young, when he didn't know uh, astronomy much at all. So when you are trying to uh, do this now, uh, are you doing to believe that he had thought through all this? And oh no, he never thought through anything. His purpose was always to tell the story. He, he uh, uh, in his science fiction stuff, he never, he, he said so. He, he, he never really cared about, uh, uh, about how real it was. What's the, you know, uh, guarantee that you will find something which oh, is... Oh, no guarantee. No guarantee. It's not fair. It's not fair to him because he had no intention of, uh, of making it. He, his, his primary purpose was not the, not the physics. He said that. He, he said his purpose was not the physics. Mm -hmm. he, he was also, uh, uh, you saw the variety of books that he wrote, and so he clearly could have done this. Mm -hmm. if, he, if he had wanted to, he could have come up with, with some more realistic system. Much later. Much life. later. Yeah. Once he, well, I don't know. I don't know much later. Probably after he got his PhD. But... Uh, but he would, uh, people would ask him, how are you able, uh, so Dr. Asimov, how are you uh, able to be an expert on so many different areas? So his answer was that uh, you don't actually have to be an expert. You just don't have to know a little bit more than the audience. <laughs> yeah. So by the way, you said Sean Raymond, somebody who yeah. did this, but how, what, what, you said he did a better job than what you did, uh, but yeah. was it consistent in what he proposed? For so this? he, he came up, I don't think that it's actually consistent with Asimov okay. because uh, he, he's come up with a system that has eclipses, but maybe the eclipse is only 600 years and not 2000 years. So it's not exactly the same. No. Okay, I have one more question. So, going beyond what you first talked about, uh, science fiction in general, uh, somehow I feel that much of science fiction is science fantasy. Even though the science word is there, mm -hmm. like you said, Asimo himself in the story yep. didn't consider science, he just imagined and wrote. So, do you agree that uh, much of science fiction is really science fantasy? Sometimes they create a new world, but what happens there is what happens on the earth. So, it's just you know, imagination, but not really rooted in science. So I think a lot of that will depend on the author, and a lot of the uh, a lot of this stuff is indeed, as you say, it's it's really in a very sen in a, in, a, in a real sense it is science fantasy. They tried to make it things that were that were uh, achievable, and so uh, if you look at uh, if you if you look at the Heinlein, the, uh, uh, the, the 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 whole lunar series. This was stuff where you go to the moon, you set up the moon as a harsh mistress in that whole series. You go to the moon, you set up a base. They won't have worked through all the technical challenges. These will all be back of the envelope kind of stuff. Or you look at uh, uh, some of the stuff, I think, I think they didn't understand how expensive it was. When Elon Musk wants to go to Mars, I don't think that he understands how difficult it is to go to Mars. 
and a lot of this, they when they had pirates going around the the asteroid belt, when they had uh, when when they had the, the the asteroids breaking away from the Earth, I don't think it's something that we thought might have been possible in the in the 60s or 70s, but now I, I think that uh, it would be a much more difficult task. So in that sense, a, a lot of them, a, a lot of these earlier people, they 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 wrote stuff that that could have been that that man that fit within the science as they understood it at the time. So you look at uh, the Venus. Uh, people thought that Venus was a was a wet world, always raining because always the clouds. And so they wrote about the swamp creatures of Venus or Mars because of the canals. You have uh, a dry planet. So you, you, you have stuff that sort of stretches reality, but not way out. And then you get the other group now, I, I think many of the people now, they're writing, and the other thing about science fiction is that you're writing stuff that, that inspires people to do that. So you look at people, a lot of the Star Trek communicators, for instance. People, people were inspired by the Star Trek communi communicators. The uh, neuromancy stuff that William Gibson wrote, where the mind, brain, I mean, the, the interface between computers and, and people. A, a lot of that uh, is, is, is stuff that, that could be possible. Okay, thank you. And I don't know how many scientists have been inspired by, 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 by science fiction. Really, you go into, you've gone into science at least partly because of science fiction. So, <clears throat> regarding science fiction in general, there is this person, you all know Harari, I'm sure you know about him. <laughs> I haven't read him. <laughs> well, he says science fiction has to be the new religion. You know. uh -huh. I mean, mankind had stories like religion and money there for the old times. But science fiction has to be the new religion. But he says science fiction as it is practiced now is not up to the mark. Uh -huh. So it has to be changed, he says. I just wanted to hear your views about that. Science fiction is what it is? The new religion. Yeah, new religion. For the 21st century. Yeah. And I, I'm, I mean, so in, in ideally it should teach you to think, right? That's what we all do. We want people to think. And uh, if you look at many of the earlier ones, I, I think they did. I think they did inspire people to think. Uh, the the modern stuff. I, I I'm not really up to date on modern science fiction because because uh, I, I grew up on, on these people, and so the, they're the people I still read. So I I don't know. I mean, a religion for the masses. <laughs> I, I guess it's better than many others. I, it's not it's not taken off very well. Thank you. I don't think people appreciate science as much as they should. Yeah, hi. Um, is it known what inspired uh, Isaac Asimov to write Nightfall in particular? Because I see some parallels between this story and something that happened around a decade ago when like the world was concerned about like you know 2012 and this Mayan calendar and it was sort of like you know the the world is going to end and so I just was thinking was there actually something uh, you could say of that sort which got Asimov to write this is it known has it been you know one of the dangers is that you is, is that people try to apply science to to uh, I mean garbage in garbage out, <laughs> so you put the Mayan calendar in uh, it was something that was a great achievement of the Mayans, but if, if you try to say that that, that predicts catastrophe, I, I think uh, mm -hmm. you're, this 20, 20, 49 year cycle and yeah, and then they burn everything down and yeah. it starts all over again. Yeah, but I, I don't think if I if I understand correctly and I, I haven't really studied the Mayan system, but I don't think they actually predicted catastrophes every every cycle. Mm -hmm. So, I think there are none. 
So with this, we come to the end of today's uh, talk. Thank you, Professor Murthy, for this insightful lecture. We have a small token of appreciation from the Office of Communication. My colleague, uh, Pratiba Gopalakrishnan, will hand it over to you. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you for and uh, please join us for tea. And we also have a gift for all the members present in the audience. Uh, we have a table uh, calendar published by the Office of Communication. And very aptly, it has been contributed by ASTRA, the Astronomy Club of IIC. We have them here. Please take a copy from here. <laughs>